Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about the Omeka Curator Dashboard Project that we're working on at the UC Santa Cruz University Library. And as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, this work is supported by a grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Um, so the goal of this project is basically to extend the functionality of Omeka in the areas of file management, metadata management, and collection development. To this end, we've developed 15 Omeka plugins that Omeka administrators can add to their sites based on their individual site needs. So I'm going to back up a little uh, for Omeka uh, new people and go into what are plugins exactly. Um, plugins are basically bundles of code that allow you to add functionality to your Omeka site. Um, it's kind of analogous to WordPress plugins or Drupal modules. Um, so by the end of this talk, I hope you have a better understanding of our development work here at the UCSC Library and also um, maybe inspired by the possibilities for adding functionality um, to your own Omeka site through some development work of your own. So, um, so the impetus for the Omeka Curator Dashboard project came from the library's work on the Grateful Dead Archive Online, or GDAO as we like to call it. Um, GDAO is a collection of materials that the library has digitized from the Grateful Dead archive and also digital materials submitted directly to the site by the Grateful Dead fan community. The uh, GDAO website is built entirely in Omeka and during the construction of GDAO, we started a wish list of Omeka functions that could help us build, manage, and preserve the objects in GDAO. <clears throat> the Omeka Curator Dashboard project is in part a result of that wish list. So, I don't really have time to go into depth on all 15 plugins we've developed. <laughs> so I'm going to go briefly over six plugins and then summarize the remaining nine just to give you a feel for their function. Um, so I'm going to start off with a feature that isn't quite as flashy <laughs> as some of our others, but it's incredibly useful nonetheless, and that's the bulk metadata editor. Uh, so the ability to make bulk changes to Omeka object metadata was highly desired by both our curators and our catalogers. In a system like GDA with over 45,000 objects, it's very labor intensive to edit metadata across a collection. For instance, if you want to change a right statement um, for a given artist, that might be 500 objects in a collection like GDA. So the bulk metadata editor plugin allows Omeka administrators to quickly change object metadata using search and replace, add new metadata, or delete existing metadata across multiple items. Um, this plugin is currently available for download on the main Omeka site. Uh, one goal of the Curator Dashboard project uh, is to increase platform interoperability. So to that end, we've developed quite a few plugins that pull objects into Omeka from other systems. At the library, we currently have the bulk of our digital collections, um, other than GDAO, and a ContentDM digital asset management system. We use ContentDM to manage our digital assets and provide the discovery and access interface. So as part of our project, we've recently created a library digital exhibit space using Omeka, and some of our Omeka exhibits will feature materials that are already in our content DM system. It would be very inefficient to manually find those images on our servers, upload the materials and their associated metadata into Omeka, and it could also result in synchronization issues. If we make a change to a content DM object, we'd have to remember it's also in an Omeka exhibit, and we need to change it there too. <laughs> Uh, so what we needed was a plugin that would allow us to import files and metadata from ContentDM and keep that metadata synced. And our ContentDM plugin is still in testing, but it does exactly that. Um, Omeka administrators can use the plugin to find objects in their own ContentDM collections and import selected objects directly into their Omeka sites. Continuing with the theme of platform interoperability, I want to discuss NuxioLink. Um, as many of the library folks here know, the California Digital Library is working on a shared collection space for UC, digital li UC Library digital materials called UCLDC, and this system is built using Nuxio. So we saw the need for both ourselves and other UC libraries to be able to pull objects and metadata from Nuxio into an Omeka exhibit space. So we built the Nuxio Link plugin in consultation with the folks at CDL. This plugin allows UC libraries who have assets in Nexio to import those objects into their own Omeka exhibit spaces. The metadata for UCLDC objects can either be crosswalked to the basic Dublin core field standard in Omeka, or you can choose to maintain the UCLDC metadata scheme. Um, and this plugin is currently available in GitHub, but you also need to talk to the UCLDC folks about being able to use it. So we talked about 
pulling objects into Omeka, um, but there's also a need for pushing Omeka objects into other systems. Um, specifically, we wanted to be able to export Omeka items and metadata into digital storage repositories for preservation purposes. Some of you are probably familiar with Merit. Merit is the digital preservation repository created by the UC Curation Center for the UC community to, pres to preserve digital assets. Um, we built the Merit Link plugin to push Omeka objects into the UC3 Merit repository. Along with the digital file, object metadata is pushed into Merit in METS format. The ability to push Omeka objects into an archival repository is particularly helpful for sites like GDAO that use Omeka as a digital asset management system. So we can now push GDAO objects directly into our Merit repository, archiving both the objects created at the library from the Grateful Dead archive and also potentially user submitted objects. So I saved some of the fun ones for the end. <laughs> uh, another goal of the Curator Dashboard project was to incorporate socially constructed Web 2.0 content into Omeka collections. Uh, and the need for this would sometimes arise with GDAO contributions. GDAO site users have the option to contribute digital materials, and images are among the most popular contributions. So we've had users give us links to their collections of digital images in Flickr and say, well, I've already digitized these. They're up on the internet. Can't you just pull them from Flickr? <laughs> and uh, the answer to that is soon to be yes. <laughs> so Flickr seemed like a good target for one of our Web 2.0 applications. And our Flickr import plugin allows Omeka administrators to pull in content from Flickr. This includes both the digital image file and the associated metadata. So you can import a single image, an entire album, or select specific images from a gallery in Flickr. The metadata in Flickr is cross-walked into the Dublin core in uh, standard in Omeka, and the tags can be imported as well. And that one is also available on the main Omeka site currently. Uh, so YouTube was also an obvious target due to the sheer amount of content and its ubiquitous use by organizations and individuals plus the prevalence of cute puppy videos. Um, this plugin lets you import a YouTube video using its URL, and this creates an Omeka item with a thumbnail image file uh, straight from YouTube. It's a be a little puppy here. Uh, and the video is actually embedded in a player field in the Omeka item record. Uh, like we did with Flickr, the metadata is imported from YouTube and crosswalked to basic Dublin Core. This plugin is available on the Omeka website and seems to be one of our most popular based on the feedback we're getting in the development community. But wait, there's more. So I have gone over six of our plugins in some detail to give you a feel for the sort of development work we've been doing and the possibilities um, of Omeka development work. But as I mentioned earlier, there are nine other plugins that are part of this Omeka Curator Dashboard project. So I'm going to try to just go over those quickly, and you can always ask me more about one of them if it piques your interest. So we've got Getty Suggest. Um, and this plugin auto-suggests subject headings from Getty vocabularies like TGN and AAT in designated metadata fields. Um, this one's also on the main Omeka site for download. Simple Vocab Plus allows you to define custom vocabulary terms from a designated list that can either live um, on your Omeka instance or in a cloud document somewhere. Um, that one's also on the Omeka site. Uh, METS export, this one came up last night, uh, lets you export your metadata in METS format um, at either the item or collection level. Again, on the Omeka site currently. Um, Media display plugin allows you to choose from a few supported viewers and assign them based on the format of an Omeka item. For instance, if an item in Omeka is an oral history type item, it could be assigned to display using the oral history metadata synchronizer, or OMS, which is a Doug Boyd University of Kentucky project. Um, contact contributors lets you send bulk emails to site users after they've contributed objects to your Omeka collection. Uh, item history log displays a record of administrative changes made to an item in your Omeka collection. This one's also on the main Omeka site. Uh, item review allows you to hold items for approval prior to making them public. So if you have people working with you who are contributors or research roles, they're not administrators, you could set this plugin to uh, require you to approve any item they add to your Omeka site. Uh, admin images allows Omeka administrators to upload images into Omeka that do not become Omeka items. Um, 
This is handy for allowing OMEC administrators to add decorative images without needing FTP access to the site. Um, and finally, one of our newest ones, SiteMap adds an XML site to your Mecca site for search engine optimization purposes. All right, and then Ned's up next, so save your questions for now. We'll get back to them. Thank you, Jess. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the Omeka developer community. So um, as someone who's come on working with this developer community to build these plugins that Jess was telling you all about, um, I want to talk about why it's important to build a community of developers to make that sort of development possible and why that's really important for the future of Omeka and for making it a useful tool for a lot of people to use. Um, let me find my slides and then I will... Down at the bottom. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. How does this work? Awesome. So I want to talk some about Omeka's specific development community and what we've been doing to connect with those and what you can do to help use that community to solve your problems, but also generally about how that applies to using open source software in general. Um, a lot of library software is starting to have really robust open source alternatives that people get excited about taking advantage of. But there are a lot of challenges involved in actually figuring out what these open source projects can do, whether they'll be useful for uni your university or your organization, and how to actually get them working. And often the development community is the answer to those questions, whether it's yes or no, that's where to go to look. Um, so I want to talk about why that's important and how you can engage with it. Um, so a lot of people ask questions about Omeka, like, can Omeka do blank? Like, this sounds really interesting, but I want my website to do X, Y, Z. Can Omeka do that? And often the answer is like, no, but it's easy to build, um, which isn't helpful for people who don't have any development resources. Um, but the reason we're excited about Omeka, I don't know why there's a lambda before it. <laughs> <laughs> But not because of what it can do now, but because of how easy it is to extend um, and how there's a low barrier for entry for a developer to come in and add a plugin to do your little XYZ. Um, in order to, I guess converting into PowerPoint might have made my slides funky. We'll see how that goes. Um, in order for it to survive and grow and do all the cool can I do X with it, it's going to have to build this developer community. So both the users and the developers have to invest in this to ever make this happen. So right now we're currently using GitHub and the Google Dev Group mostly, at least the UCSC branch is using those tools mostly to connect with other users and other developers. So that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit in this talk, how those are useful, how you can use them, and how we can go forward from there. Um, so. Why do we really care about creating a developer community? Or why should you care as potentially not a developer in investing in this community? Um, mainly because when you're adopting a big piece of software, you really need support, not just in setting it up, but in using it continually and telling you whether it's a good software to use in the start and actually maintaining it when it's upgraded down the road. Um, and when you're buying software from a big company that's your tech support people and you can call them up and they have customer support that you're paying for to answer these questions for you. The developer community is that for you if you're using open source software. But, you know, they're not paid by you, so you have to, you know, build this up. Um, and it can be expensive to, you know, manage a bunch of licenses for commercial software. It can also be extensive expensive to hire people who know the skills you have to interface with this community and do the open source work. Um, and where the tipping point is for whether it's better to contract out your tech support versus having somebody in-house managing a bunch of open source platforms depends on how good this developer network is and how responsive it is to their questions and how easy it is for your techie developer person to talk to the people who know the answers that they need. On the other side, um, this isn't just about the developers out there who don't work for you helping you out because they're nice people. You know, I mean, developers are nice people and we like writing open source software for people, but, you know, we have jobs. <laughs> um, but it helps the developers too. Um, 
And part of that is because, you know, we write the code and it works for us and it's really expensive to make sure it's going to work for everybody's system and for everybody's need. You have to test it on all these different things. And we can skip a lot of that if we can rely on other people using it to say, hey, I really need this and XYZ doesn't work. I'm going to go back and fix it. Um, so you're saving the developer's time and energy and not having to do as extensive user testing by doing it yourself and speaking up when something goes wrong. Um, and you can contribute to the project by, you know, trying out a piece of software that might not work and telling them exactly what goes wrong. It's a way to contribute to a project when you don't have money or time to develop. Um, also, your questions become data themselves. You know, we're a bunch of people who really care about saving archival metadata and stuff. When you ask a developer a question, that should be archived. That will be part of their record that they were a responsive developer. They might use all the people who asked them questions that were responded to as part of their resume later. You know, it's public record. Look, I made a piece of software. I answered all these questions. Here are a bunch of people who found my software useful. It's immensely useful for developers, whether you're satisfying grants or applying for jobs. Um, and, you know, if you are giving regular feedback connected to a developer, it can be better, it can be more, save the developer time compared to writing down the answer to every possible question to just answer them when they come up. Because if you write a thick manual on your um, code, most people aren't going to read most of it, and also most of the information in there is not going to be useful. If you wait for questions, you can answer the few things that people actually want to know. So it helps both the users and the developers to be connected this well. So I think it's really important if you're going to use Omeka or any open source software, uh, no matter what level of technological know-how you are, to connect with these open to connect with these developer communities, um, ask questions when you have them. So I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing and how to do that. Um, so yeah, you get out of this what you put in. Um, from the developer side, you have to have you know. It'd be easy to find where to contact you. You have to have your code. The more well-written and easy to understand it is, the more people will be able to pick it up and contribute. Um, if you, know, you have everything very clear, this is how I would like you to tell me what's wrong, and this is how you can make it better, people will do that, and otherwise not. From a user perspective, when you come to this community with questions, it can be very intimidating because there's a lot of jargon, a lot of, you know, it's a public forum for people who might know a lot of stuff that you don't know and you're trying to get your question asked. But um, if you're patient with the fact that you might not understand all the jargon and ask a lot of questions and are very specific, then you'll create a useful question and a useful problem people will thank you for. And if you just say, like, my computer is not working, can you fix it for me? People will say, no, I can't. Um, I do something totally different than that. <laughs> um, so this is one of those things where, you know, together we have to do the job of like a hierarchy mixed with a company system where usually companies have, you know, developers and then they have tech support people and user interface people who really care about user friendliness, but the developers don't. And they have whole layers of management whose whole job it is to get those people to speak the same language. And we have to do it on our own. So it takes a lot of patience and communication skills, but it's the only way to make it work without paying a huge company to do it all, which can be inefficient for a lot of these challenges that we can do together. So um, the patience and the communication skills are key. Um, so we use GitHub a lot. That's a really useful site for engaging with tons of different open source development communities. Basically, it's just a repository where you put your code online and people can download it easily. It's its basic functionality. So you can go to the Omeka website and download these plugins. You can also go to the GitHub page and you'll see like the most recent code and you can download the same thing. Um, but you can also see all of the previous iterations of the code. You can see what changes they made last week. Um, and you can post your own issues, like bug reports. You can click on issues for a project and add one of your own and it'll pop right up on the developer's thing and you can see them reply. It tracks those and can tell you when they're completed which means we as developers can collect data about how many people care about this, how many issues we've completed. It's really useful um, to go through their systems and they have good ones for keeping track of um, contributing fixes and stuff. So not only can you tell people when it's wrong, you can download all their code, change it, and suggest a change. Say, okay, I fixed this bug for you. All you have to do is click okay and now it's part of the code forever. 
So that's great. Those are really useful skills. But it's a website that can be pretty intimidating if you're not a tech person. It's not clear how all of the bells and whistles work, and you might have to Google a tutorial on it and read it. But if you're hitting your head up against how do I get help with Omeka, with this plugin, or with this other open source project, that's probably a useful investment of time, is to just learn how that site is generally working so you can engage with it. Um, another great way with the lower barrier for entry is the Google group. Um, so just, you know, you can totally uh, join this group. You don't have to be a developer to join the Omeka dev list, but that's where a lot of developers are. And Posting questions there will also be public, and other people will be able to benefit from the answers. Um, so that's a great place to ask questions, and we've had a bunch of good feedback from there too. Um, but it's you know most people have more familiar with how message boards and groups work, you know, threaded messages and stuff. So that's a little bit easier, but a different format that has its own benefits. It's going to be 15 backs and forths, then you know people won't read the 15th or whatever. Um, so, so far, we've had a lot of good feedback from both of these methods on our plugin, so it's been an effective way of, as far as we can tell, connecting with users. Of course, we don't know how many users there are with questions they don't ask, um, but so far we've had, you know, more people bringing stuff up on GitHub than the development list, but some really important ones from the development list, and um, both have been good ways to get in touch with us as developers, um, in GitHub there have been more people asking, you know, identifying problems than contributing code. So I see that there's probably more interest from the user end than the developer end, which makes sense. Um, but it would be cool to get some, you know, to get to a point where there's more um, developers trying to build a cool tool and want to use Omeka for that, um, in addition to users who want there to be a cool feature and are trying to download Omeka for that. Um, so another alternative to those you can do is to contact directly someone you know is working on it. And I like to discourage that a little bit more because it doesn't create that public record of the exchange. Um, so you can't look back at, you know, and list easily all the people who've contacted you directly for help to analyze what they're all looking for and see what's important. Um, nor can other people go back and look at your question and get their questions answered. So it's usually better to ask on one of the public forums, but you certainly can, and there's you know, groups that connect you to other developers that you know, it's absolutely encouraged if you have a question that doesn't fit on any of the public forums to just get in touch with somebody, because people want you to use their code. Um, no matter what they're building, it's better with users. Um, so if that's gonna make the difference, send someone an email, and people are generally really nice. Um, so, Thanks very much, that's all I've prepared, and um, yeah, absolutely feel free to ask whatever questions you want about our suite of plugins or the developer community. So for clarification first, this is basically grant funded development, is that correct? This was all the IMLS funded? Yes, okay. all the development we've done oh, has great. been, That's... but there is other Omeka development that is not uh, oh, grant funded. Oh no, absolutely, I understand so, that. Yes. Um, so my question is, is, so it's been said that there's no such thing as a one-time investment. So you guys are de developing this great code base, all these plugins. Um, what do you see as the long-term strategy for managing all that code? Well, if we can curate a development community of, you know, users slash developers who are invested in using this, then hopefully a lot of the maintenance work could be done by the community in the sense of the crowdsourcing code, which in the past, you know, for other projects has worked with varying efficiency. There's a lot, there are some shining examples of projects that got started as open source projects and then became kind of community curated and worked really well. There are also plenty that have failed miserably. Um, so it'll take some continued um, maintenance work that has to be done, you know, we certainly plan on supporting these plugins as long as we have the resources to. Otherwise, it's possible through building these development communities that they could pick up the slack if that becomes impossible. At least makes it easier to pass it on to another institution who might have support for it. Oh. 
Hi, just a quick question about uh, your content DM link and your other links uh, for getting data into Omeka. These, I'm assuming, or actually the question is, are these one-time instances or does any sort of link remain live so that if something's updated in content DM, for example, will it automatically update in Omeka? Um, yeah, we added uh, synchronization abilities for the content DM plugin, um, and but it's optional because some people might be using content DM once to manage their assets and they want to pull them all out into Omeka and never look back. <laughs> and other people want to use content DM as a dams continually and just use exhibit spaces. So there is a synchronization option where if you make a change in content DM, that change will be reflected in the object in your Omeka instance as well. Okay, so that's automatic then. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. What did, what was the time frame for that? Twenty four hours? Or? I think that's what we yeah. decided. It checks mm -hmm. every twenty four hours for changes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um. I I work right now with art history materials, and so the Getty suggest sounds fantastic. Um. So I wonder. I have a couple questions on that. How did you choose the Getty vocabularies? Do you have ideas for others that you would want to include, and will you include Ulan? Oh uh, well. Uh, the li there's Library of Congress Suggest is already an Omeka plugin, and that was kind of our inspiration <laughs> or our template for building Getty Suggest. Uh, a big reason for Getty, we use TGN pretty extensively in our collections. We have a lot of maps. Um, AAT we also use to some degree, and Getty uh, has a really good API. That was a big part of the reason for choosing that one. And I'm actually not familiar with the other vocabulary you mentioned. Uland is the union list of artist names, so it's albeit okay. very targeted to uh -huh. a specific community, um, but it's another Getty one. Okay. Well, one of the reasons that we're doing the Getty ones now and that we don't have all of the vocabularies supported is Getty is just now getting their vocabularies up on linked open data. So when we were building this plugin, the two that we put in were the only two that were available at the time. And I think since then, I think Uland has gotten on Just last week. Cool. <laughs> so that's next on the list. <laughs> but yeah, we're absolutely taking advantage of that new functionality. It, we couldn't have built the plugin before that existed. Awesome. Up questions. Yes. So you mentioned that you have so many plugins, uh, for example, the Content DM1, Naxio, uh, Flickr, and YouTube. Mm -hmm. So um, there's so many tools for creating digital collections. How do you make decisions as far as using what tool for what collection? I'm a little bit confused. Do you mean like how did we choose, how did we target those specific applications to build plugins for, or like how would you choose to use? you know, content DM versus Omeka for? Um, more like, how do you choose content DM versus Flickr versus YouTube versus Nuxio? Yeah. Because those are all DMs that you use, I assume, yeah. for your digital collections, right? So Yeah, so I guess we think, I mean, you can pull in your own institution's materials from YouTube and Flickr, but we really liked the socially constructed aspect of those. So I, I think we would use those more to pull in materials that would not be in our content DM collections or would not be in our Nuxio collections. Um, there, there's a great manuscript collection that was up in Flickr. Um, there's YouTube videos uh, from you know, George Mason University and about using Omeka, for instance, <laughs> uh, that you could pull into your sites. Um, so yeah, it's more the socially constructed aspect. Or as I mentioned with the Grateful Dead Archive online, we had users of that site who wanted to contribute their photographs that they'd taken, and they'd already uploaded them to Flickr, and they said, They're already, these already exist in Flickr. I want to give them to the Grateful Dead archive online, but I don't want to upload all of them a second time. You know, They're already on the web. They're already digitized. Can't you guys just pull them in from Flickr? So we wanted to be able to do that. Um, and for Content DM and Nexio, those will be mostly, well, those will be all our materials that we're pulling in to an exhibit. So while we're using Content DM to manage our digital assets, and it'll be like the record of record, um, we could pull in objects for an exhibit inside Omeka that might last for three months or six months. Um, they'll be a little more ephemeral. And in Omeka, you can add 
context to those items. So you can add narrative, um, multimedia, make it like a real exhibit where Content DM is really more of an asset management system. It doesn't allow you to do that. Okay. Hi, I have a question because we're doing another project on the Uncommon Place exhibition um, at the Cessnon Gallery, uh -huh. and we have all of our images uploaded to Google Drive, and they're high res. And um, then can we export them or import them over to um, Omeka? They're already digitized, and then do you want this huge high-res file, or are we looking just at a little low-res JPEG, and do we have to re-upload? Oh, for the drive thing, I don't know. Turn that over there. We've done some thinking about um, importing from Google Drive, especially with relation to some big data sets that faculty and sometimes store there, but haven't really come up with a good plan for that yet. But it's a problem that other people have, so it's something that there are other incentives to get going. Um, Google's got a nice API to download stuff, so in theory it shouldn't be that hard, but with big high resolution files or large data sets, you get um, problems with having enough bandwidth and a place to store it, and you know where you install Omeka has to be able to accommodate all this stuff, so it makes a little bit more complications for the user, um, and as always with big files. But your question about like do we need the big file or do we even want that in Omeka, um, in some ways that's up to the Omeka user. If they only want a little picture, then you absolutely don't need a huge high res file and you can convert that um, and maybe save some, you know, uploading and downloading time if you can do that on Google side. I can actually answer that question a little bit too. Just that um, part of the reason that we actually wrote the Content DM plugin was for that for your specific project because a lot of that material for the Uncommon Place exhibit is it already in Content DM, and we wanted to not only get all the images out but also all the metadata because we've had a cataloger who goes through and has spent hours, you know, giving them a title and subjects and things like that. So that's what uh, so Ed, we'll be able to go through and just click all those boxes off or do the search from within. Omeka and just transfer everything over in Content DM. So it'll just be the materials from planning and uh, from the facilities management that we have to move over. And we can do that with a spreadsheet. So, well, we'll you know. But anyway, so, so that, the, but that, your project was um, an impetus for the whole Content DM thing. Mm -hmm.